Uh, welcome to Anna Avalos, who is the Telemedicine Coordinator and Interim Stroke Education Coordinator at Grand River Hospital. Anna? Thank you, Tina. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Erica Teleg. Um, she is a stroke and cognitive behavioral neurologist by training. Having finished her neurology uh, psychiatry residency in the, at the University of Santo Tomas in Manila, Philippines, she then proceeded to complete a three-year clinical and research stroke fellowship with the Calgary Stroke Program in Alberta from 2016 to 2019. She then proceeded to complete another three-year clinical fellowship in cognitive and behavioral neurology with the University of Toronto at the Baycrest Health Science Center. Her research and clinical interests include vascular cognitive impairment, neuro neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia and small vessel disease. She joined the stroke team at Grand River Hospital, St. Mary's Hospital Kitchener last year and hopes to build roots in the Kitchener and Waterloo region. We are so happy that Dr. Teleg joined our team. She has been instrumental in her role at Grand River Hospital. Despite being invaluable to our team, she is humble and refers to herself as a plumber because she works on the pipes of the body. Your plumbing skills are irreplaceable, Dr. Teleg, and we are so happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for, for that um, wonderful introduction. And thank you for the Central South Regional Stroke Network for, for having me today. And this is quite a, a, a very much important topic that we will discuss today. So um, approach to post-stroke fatigue. And in the next minutes or so, let me guide you in terms of putting on a special emphasis in, in the recovery phase of, of our patient. So these are my disclosures. So I am not a stroke recovery specialist, but I am a stroke and behavioral cognitive neurologist. And as Anna has said, I did have combine, a combined urology and psychiatry program as my postgraduate residency back home in the Philippines. Now, um, these, I would revert everyone to, to um, this um, uh, edition of the Canadian Stroke Best Practices in 2019 that puts a spotlight on mood, cognition, and fatigue. And the importance of this edition is timely screening assessment um, for post-stroke fatigue and, and other mood disorders and behaviors that we may observe during the recovery phase and even in the hyperacute to the acute phase. And, and this edition emphasizes partnerships and collaborations between the stroke team and the stroke team consists of the patients and, and the, the team as well as the patient recovers. And this is to ensure you know, that there is timeless, seamless care throughout the recovery. So um, these are my objectives. And the first is to define and describe the burden of disease and how to measure. Second is to discuss an, the approach to post-stroke fatigue using a case model framework. And third is to discuss healthcare team and patient-centered approaches. Let me begin with a case that will guide us through our objectives. So. I have encountered a 58-year-old right-handed female who came in with language disturbance. And her symptom is, I cannot get the words out, and she has no motor deficits. So fairly, in our eyes, seems like a minor stroke, but language disturbance in itself is quite a significant functional impairment. At baseline, she's independent in all her ADLs. Vascular risk factors include hypertension, but we know that she has depression, is taking an antidepressant, and she has diabetes. Her ischemic stroke by imaging suggested or revealed ischemic stroke, which seems to be embolic, involving two different vascular territories, posterior and anterior circulation. And the mechanism we are ongoing as, as a stroke team to find out through the investigations. She recovered, quote unquote, to baseline. And we used a modified ranking score to measure disability, and it's seemingly zero. She can communicate fairly well. She can complete her sentences. She can do conversations. So she's discharged to home three months, follow up to us back in the SPC. So let's answer the first definition or the first objective is to define and describe the burden of disease and how to measure post-stroke fatigue, depression, and apathy. Now, by the guidelines, 
post-stroke fatigue encompasses a multidimensional um, nuances, motor perceptive, physical fatigue, emotional fatigue, and mental cognitive fatigue, right? And it is characterized by a feeling of early exhaustion with weariness. And this is not only in the basis of certain activities, right? But these patients we see with post-stroke fatigue is that even getting to the bathroom wears them out. So you are able to know your patient as the patient is admitted and see how this patient accepts and recovers based on how he, he or she exerts herself or himself, right? So there is lack of energy. There is aversion to effort that develops during the physical or mental task. And usually rest does not alleviate it. So as I said, objective fatigue, meaning we can measure the fatigue. Um, and this is where our allied health is very nuanced because you work with the patient, right, in terms of the residual deficits, right? And you see what in what spectrum the fatigue is, is encased in. And subjective fatigue, the patient will tell you, right? And mental, physical, and emotional, as I said. Now, by epidemiology, post-stroke fatigue is prevalent stroke consequence. So this is where at the hyperacute phase, you are already thinking of this patient's fatigue, right? So you are affect it affects more than 50% of stroke survivors. And if you look through evidence and literature, the epidemiology frequency prevalence ranges far off, 29 to 77%, very varied numbers, right? And this is so because it's difficult to define. It's difficult to identify and it's difficult to characterize and, and measure. Right, So prevalence cannot be explained by the type of stroke, side of stroke or lesion stroke, but they did say um, in, in certain literature and in certain um, um, case reports, the larger the stroke, the, the more um, post-stroke fatigue is, is experienced by the patient, which makes sense because the brain is working harder than it should be, right, in terms of, of trying to keep up and heal. Now, in terms of the second, so I am going to kind of do a practical approach using our case model, right? So this is an article by Wu et al, which gives a model of understanding of fatigue after stroke. And I use this in my practice, even as I see my patients from the emergency room to the stroke unit and back in the community. And I tell my patients and I tell my team, the real work begins when the patient goes home. We do our due diligence in checking the boxes in terms of mechanisms, investigations in treatment and management and prevention. But in the end, it is the patient who does the work, right? So let's go back to our patient. Our patient we find out is a single mom. She's a very high functioning lady. In baseline, she's sociable and, and likes to travel, right? She multitasks, right? So that's she's a high functioning lady, right? And, and we know from, from the case is that she has depression at base. Line. So that in itself, you will observe already as your patient recovers in the stroke unit. How is this patient's confidence? You have to understand stroke is a life changing event for anyone from the patient to the family. And this is where your empathy comes in play, right? Now, the stroke is a trigger, right? So stroke is a brain assault. And this brain is trying to adapt, right? We think of stroke often as a deficit, the deficit. We, we approach it as what are the deficits? But in recovery and in, in the stroke unit, even after we give our hyperacute treatment, we have to think what is left? What can we save? How can we help the other areas of the brain adapt to what can be saved? And as we see, this patient has two vascular territory strokes. I tell my patient, if the brain is the city, the brain stem is actually Grand Central Station or it's Toronto Pearson Airport, all the networks. It's a tall way, right? And it just makes sense that the patient is more tired as usual, having two separate strokes, right? And even though the patient is able to, to do the simple tasks, I find out, right, later on, after one month, when I see the patient in the community, Dr. Teleg, I can't work. Everything is in slow motion, they will say, they, they, she tells me. Everything that I did that was automatic, I had to do it stepwise, right? And, and this is where you kind of like, am I dealing with 
signs of early fatigue or late fatigue. Now, early fatigue is very varied. You may observe that even during the, when the patient is, is in recovery, right? And there may also be coexisting symptoms as you see in the unidirectional. And this is where you will try to understand what are the variables contributing to the fatigue? Is it pain? Is it sleep? Is it anxiety? Now you will see in the four boxes after the early fatigue, wherein it's bi-directional in terms of the physical factors, psychological factors, and behavioral factors. Now you have to understand, as I said, with stroke patients, we are dealing with deficits. And this is the patient is, is trying to reconcile with herself. What are my deficits? Will this render me disabled? Our patient, luckily, in, in during the unit, seemed very motivated and feels that she's back to normal. But then again, as she goes and transitions to the community, there that is where she discovers there may be some disability, some difficulty and challenge. Now, the second box is psychological factors. It means self-efficacy, your ability to know yourself your ability to adapt, your confidence in yourself, and how in terms of being able to adapt to the change, you are able to say that you have a locus of control. And even though there is a shift uh, of, of control in which the deficit puts on you, how can you adapt? So that is a measure of how self-efficacious you are as a person, right? So that in itself affects your overall disability at this time. Third is your behavioral factors. So how is this patient coping, right? It does not make sense once the patient goes back to the community, he or she is motivated to do physiotherapy for a Monday and Tuesday, she's totally exhausted. So this is where you have to balance and be aware of how your patient is motivating himself to actually improve her behavior, right? And this will all contribute to late fatigue. And maybe in the first month, she was well, right? She attended her daughter's wedding. She's planning to go back to work. But then again, in terms of going back to the real, real routine, pre-stroke, she experiences these difficulties. Now, if you see on the fourth, uh, on the first box here, the affective factors, right? And this is where the overlap of post-stroke fatigue comes with depression and anxiety. We know that our patient has depression. And this in itself may help us predict if this patient will be able to cope in terms of, of everything that she has experienced throughout her recovery. May, if she is on antidepressant, this may actually be already helping her in terms of her recovery, right? Now, in some patients who don't have baseline depression and anxiety, this is where you become nuanced in being able to assess if at the first 10 days in the stroke unit, if medically appropriate, you should be doing your objective skills for depression and anxiety. And this is where I inculcate family collateral information, community supports to find out who is this patient? How do I think this patient will cope with this change in life, right? And all of this will contribute to maybe even prevent late fatigue. And this is where also as well, the response and support from significant others, collateral history, um, patients, close-knit family in the community um, is able to help us with it. So post-stroke fatigue extends not only from the patient, but it also extends to the family. And this is why we pay special attention to our caregiver as well. So the affective factors, as I said, post-stroke depression and apathy plays a role in fatigue. And there is already a strong, strong association between the two. And there is a trend between an association be between fatigue and anxiety, right? Worry. And furthermore, there are two longitudinal studies that reported that baseline depression and anxiety were both associated with, with follow-up fatigue. So things can overlap. Um, in the interim. Now, in the uh, edition of the Canadian Stroke Best Practices, this is how they define depression following stroke. In the category of the DSM-5, it's mood disorders due to another medical condition. And that is our, our stroke, right? And as I said earlier, the larger the stroke, the, lar the large vessel infarctions are usually associated with severity of, of, of strokes. Now, vascular depression is a term that they 
they give to small vessel ischemia. In my practice, I see this with our geriatric patients as well. So the difference is it's later age and onset. There's a greater cognitive impairment, and you will see the other external variables in the in in, in that is in play in the families uh, uh, in the in the patients' um, circle, right? So if there's less family and personal um, supports at home, now sometimes these patients don't even have depression um, at baseline, and uh, there this may contribute to greater physical impairment um, more than that are non-vascular um, depressed patients. Apathy overlaps with everything, and as defined in the best practices, it's also multi-dimensional syndrome, right? So it's diminished goal-directed behavior, emotion, cognition, and a loss of initiative. You have to understand that there are several um, strokes based on their territory, more so in the frontal lobe and the executive circuits, you will observe apathy um, as, as a symptom of, or as a deficit of the stroke. And basically we'll be able to differentiate because we will know that at baseline, this patient was had a different kind of personality. And it is wherein the stroke that affects the network frontal executive function, we later on um, experience or, or observe this in our patients. And this in itself can contribute to fatigue, depression, and anxiety. Now, the overlap of behavior. So low mood versus depression, right? So low mood is situational. It's usually non-persistent and it's usually non-debilitating. And apathy is not very much significant in, in, low mood in low mood patients when we use the term low mood. Now, when we say depression, and that is defined by the DSM-5 um, um, criteria or categories, it's actually more debilitating, it's more persistent, and you will see a gamut of whole other symptoms. And this is where I always ask the family, do you think there is risk for safety? Do you think there is risk of harm for the patient? Do you think the patient is at risk for suicidal, if there are suicidal ideations? So this is fairly important to, to understand, even in the acute setting. Um, and again, as I said, apathy is, is motivational disorders, right? And you will see this in patients who are fairly impaired in terms of their cognition, um, aphasic patients. So there's indifference, there is, um, um, uh, uh, a liking to be to be withdrawn, right? To avoid social contacts. There's diminished um, ability to concentrate and a diminished ability to to initiate tasks, right? And anhedonia is is a loss of of pleasure. And this is where, in terms of later on, I will at least give the, the guidelines for medication use or pharmacotherapy in in terms of managing this from from that setting. Number three. We recommend approach to assessment, evidence-based treatment and management. Excuse me. I hope there are no questions. <laughs> so number three, when to assess, right? So number one, prior to discharge, and number two, following return to the community. Now, the caveat to that is that we screen if it's deemed medically appropriate, what does that mean? It does not make sense if your patient is mute and your patient is completely plegic on one side that you screen fatigue or depression, right? Because it's not medically appropriate at this time and maybe you may need to delay um, later on as the patient tries to improve in some of the deficits or remain stable at least, right? So that is the caveat in terms of the guidelines of when to assess. Now, following return to the community, and as I told you earlier, the real work begins when the patient goes home to the community. And this is where I'd like to follow up my patients one month, two months, three months as needed and let the family physicians integrate the family physicians and the allied healthcare community, uh, allied healthcare in the community to kind of see where we can help the patient, right? So a transfer from inpatient acute setting to inpatient rehabilitation setting 
number one. Number two, from inpatient setting to return to the community and during secondary prevention clinic visits, right? So we're not only dealing with periodic health assessments, but we're also dealing, or in secondary stroke prevention, but we're also dealing with how is this patient coping, right? Of course, every one of us wants the best for our patient. If the patient can go back to being as independent as he or she can be, that is our goal, right? And in my practice, I tell my patients, if you have a set bar pre-stroke, we need to reset it a little bit lower first till we try to achieve the most optimum state that you are comfortable and you are absolutely independent in your own ability. And this is where they appreciate me telling them, right? I have begun in my practice in the hyperacute setting when I speak to my patients' families, this is what you will expect or may not expect. I already give them a heads up, right? Because most of the time our patients will say, I felt well two weeks after my stroke, such as our case, right? But when I went back to work, I couldn't function. And, and um, they had to let me go for a bit of time to, to rest. So that's the most important thing. Now, how to measure? And this is where our allied health is more nuanced, is, is a lot nuanced because we do have objective scales, right? And this, um, our physiotherapists, our occupational therapists and our speech and language um, 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 therapists are able to kind of work with the patient and see them on, on a more consistent basis during the, the recovery phase, right? And you will be able to even gauge the nonverbal um, frustration of the patient if she does feel that or or the motivation of the patient right and that helps us clinicians right if that is documented i look at the notes i look at your notes right and that helps me understand my patient even better right and of course our other specialists on the on in freeport here in kitchener right so um um our physiatrists as well they're they're able to gauge the the patient's um improvement or if this patient will need further, further help in the community. And of course, we have our psychiatrists and behavioral neurologists to kind of give us, give us a lifeline, right? If this patient needs some sort of pharmacotherapy to, to, to bridge and, and improve certain things, right? So, and then again, of course, as I told you, family and the caregivers, post-stroke fatigue extends to them as well. And this is where I ask my patient's wife or my patient's husband, how are you doing? How are the children, right? How is the change? How is the change at home, right? Do you need help? at home, right? Is there anything we can do that we can provide as a stroke service to, to help ease a little bit of, of certain things, right? And and some patients will tell me, Dr. Teleg, we just want like maybe if there's a day program for language. And this is where I look, um, when I started here in Kitchener, I looked at what resources are available, at least in the in the community, right? And and the, the Lynn is very good at that in trying to kind of check the boxes of how we can help. Now, fatigue severity scale is sometimes what I use, and usually it's a simple scale used for for some for our patients, right? It's it's it consists of um uh, of nine parameters, and they will just um circle which one which one is more more for them, right? We agree to strongly, and it's fairly simple, right? And this is where I elaborate, right? What what are the activities that you can do now? Right? How is these this activity making you more tired, or or what? How is your sleep as well? Are you taking more naps than usual? Because naps are okay, you know. But if it's going to affect your nighttime, then maybe we can try to see and find an activity during daytime that you are busy, so your nighttime sleep is not affected. So something like that. What is your day like? What tires you, and what helps you rest? Right. And then on the other hand, in terms of depression scales, we have the standardized depression scales like the, the handy um, or the geriatric depression scales, because um, that is at least an objective scale that if you do in the, in the hospital and then I see it and in the clinic, I can compare and do and do how and, and kind of gauge how is our patient improving, right? Now, in terms of apathy scales, some of them are validated and some are not. Um, several evidence for the use of fatigue severity scales um, in, in strokes are, are not really yet um, validated in large numbers, but most of it has been validated, validated in the MS group. 
um, I think this was the German group, lots of, of, of studies and lots of numbers using that, um, validating the fatigue severity scale. So we use it similarly to how we can apply it for our stroke patients. So my pharmacological approach, so we'll go to the pharmacological approach is if maybe I treat anxiety and depression, I maybe can help with sleep. If I treat sleep, maybe I can help with attention and depression. If I treat depression, maybe I can help with motivation. So if you treat depression, maybe I can help with attention and memory. And I usually start low and go slow in terms of my pharmacological approach if I do decide to put these patients on, on, on some pharmacological intervention. And I always follow up with the patients and, and their caregivers, right? Now, the the... Recommendation is to watch first the patient, right? Two to four weeks after the post-stroke, right? To see how this patient is coping and maybe you don't need intervention in terms of an antidepressant. But if you do decide and there are signs, objective and subjective signs of post-stroke depression, we consider an antidepressant medication trial, right? And the good response is a minimum of six to 12 months. We monitor for side effects. No response in two to four weeks, we may increase the dosage. And as I will remind you, I usually start low and go slow, right? And add additional medication or, or change it, right? And you have to let the family know this is not an overnight intervention. We will not observe um, uh, effectiveness or efficacy within a short amount of time. This is, this is something that we will see gradually and how to maintain it as well, right? And in terms of doing the, the tapering, I also start low and go slow in terms of tapering if I need to decrease the medication to start a new one. So I don't start two medications at once because if the patient worsened or there was some improvement, I do not know which one did what, right? So this is where we don't want to do a lot of polypharmacy for the patient, right? So this is where you try, you, you go one by one, very slowly at that. Now, in terms of the summary table for selected pharmacotherapy for post-stroke depression, much of the evidence comes from the SSRI groups. So usually, as you will see, citalopram on the first column here, fluoxamine, fluoxetine, particularly citalopram and fluoxetine, they're the landmark trials for, for they have do have landmark trials for post-stroke depression. And then you have your SNRIs and, and your other medications. Now, I'll give you an example. If your patient is not walking, if your patient has difficulty in balance, it does not make sense that you give trazodone for sleep, right? Because this also has a very sedating effect and you do not want your patient to fall. If your patient has trouble with sleep, you can try a low dose mirtazapine, 7.5 milligram. When you go above 13 milligrams as you, as you increase, the mirtazapine reverses its mechanism of action. And as an antidepressant, this patient will become activated. So you do not increase mirtazapine or, or remeron when this, in patients to prevent, to, to uh, help with sleep, right? So lots of things that you can consider with special, special emphasis on the side effects, especially on the most elderly patients, right? If you have cholinergic or anticholinergic effects, you do not want to, to affect the patient's cognition or, or baseline dementia um, in choosing these special pharmacological interventions. Now, more importantly, as I as, as the pharmacological approach is just as important, the non-pharmacological approach is in parallel um, in terms of guiding the patient and trying to counsel the family, right? So patient-centered or patient-oriented approach. I tell my patient, you will expect the fatigue, right? Not that you are discouraging the patient to work, but you are asking the patient to be kind to herself, right? To pace herself, to reset the bar, because we need time to reprogram the circuits. So that's the language I use with my patient. And what is reality versus expectation, right? And you ask for help. Ask for help, I tell my patients. If you do not, if you need help, you open you open yourself for help, right? And, and, and it's in, in the end of the day, as much as you want to be motivated to be as independent as you are, you will need to ask help in some days 
that you you feel you feel like you are not as independent as you can be more so you've had a stroke right and most especially direct your patient to resources and knowledge is power and i use the canadian stroke best practices website and i usually show this to the family if you have any questions and you cannot call the stroke prevention clinic look at this website and in terms of the checklist you have it all here conserve the energy right so establish daily routines and habits that make sense to you plan to do things you need to do each day for the times that you have the most energy pace your activities position your body comfortably for the task right especially for those who have physical residual deficits prioritize the goals for the task and what needs to be done right what is important what is less important what is not so important and then reflect right so if you are especially tired in one day think about what you did the day before right and it, if if 15 minutes walking is okay and you try to do 20 minutes the next day and it wears you out go back to 15 minutes and maybe as you build insurance endurance and stamina you'll eventually get to 17 minutes 20 minutes 25 minutes and so on right and then stay healthy of course everything will not be at work if the system is not healthy and it's not being looked after so we are on the other side of the stroke team we are trying to prevent strokes we are addressing the blood pressure we're addressing the cholesterol we are addressing heart disease everything else comes integrated in terms of how the patient accepts th these treatments and these interventions and how he or she will understand how he or she can cope later on. So again, caregiver resources, right? So you have to understand the caregiver, right? And if the caregiver needs help or he, she has adequate supports at home, right? So questions and patients questions of patients and family of us. We did undergo good rehabilitation, but after returning home, this, this, and this, and this happened, right? We found out that this, and this, and this, and this, right? So this is where you kind of say, okay, I may call on my community allied health to help us, right? And see if that, if if they do have some strategies to help with the patient's fatigue, right? Or I refer to my physiotherapist um, at that, right? Or just simply going through the, what's your day like? Tell me, since you got home, what was your routine, right? So this kind of gives you a sense that maybe if you do, uh, just in this area or in this department, maybe we can improve this one. So this is like a conversation and I take time doing this with, with at least my follow-up patients. So sleep hygiene, we stick to the routine, do something relaxing before bed. Um, this is also helping everyone here who are stroke champions, right? So try to avoid simulating activities prior to bed and well-being, right? So again, consider joining one of the, the the community community of survivors i think we do have here in 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 the region right in the in the districts right so consider online stroke recovery groups the children of patients and their families are actually they want to know more right they want to know how they can help their their family member who suffered the stroke and you empower them by by doing so and letting them know we are a team at that now, this is my summary and take home for today. You will not be aware of post-stroke fatigue unless you ask and anticipate it. So there is no blood work or imaging modality for this, right? So the the um, in 2016, when I when I um, started my stroke fellowship in Calgary, we were at the height of hyperacute stroke care. We were fishing out clots. We were pulling them out. We were improving door to needle times, right? But in the end of the day, after we do the work in terms of the hyperacute, it's not yet done. The work does not end there. So we anticipate from the hyperacute setting to recovery and ask for help from other specialists and allied help if needed, right? We, we collaborate. We try to understand what else we can do for this patient. And this is what integrates us and makes us strong as a stroke team. And number three is, uh, I keep saying, right? I keep saying, boot camp right the work does not end after the hyper acute to subacute stroke care it extends towards the home and and it is our hope that you know we, we prevent one stroke at a time but we also help the patients who did get the stroke and and help them cope as as they recover and with that um thank you for having me um today it is my first time doing this for for the region and um i'm happy to take questions and comments and and um uh, Anna will have my details just in case you you want to collaborate with me or or send me an email anything at all my my uh, 
my uh, plumbing services are always always uh, twenty four seven open. Thank you so much. I will stop sharing my slides now. Thank you very much, Dr. Tuleg. That was uh, incredible. And I can definitely hear your passion in your presentation. Uh, so please go ahead and you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question verbally. Uh, you can type it in the Q&A, um, also in the chat if that is easier. And just want to let you know that as anybody that may need to leave, um, there will be um, a, a short survey in uh, as you exit the webinar that we would love for you to. Okay, so there's a question uh, from Shannon saying, can you um, uh, share the screening tool for fatigue? And for sure. yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So I will send it to to the boss Tina and I. <laughs> And and then yeah, we can like so the thing is that I was thinking we can maybe try doing it to our cases. We can measure it from the acute phase, you know, just choosing the patients we can do for and then see how how the data is, right? In terms of, of how they kind of understand. But I'm happy to to share that. Um, um I'll I'll email it to you, Tina. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, if anyone is interested, um, please reach out to me because I won't have access to everyone's email, but um, you can ask me for that. Uh, there's a question from Melissa. So thank you very much for this great presentation. Is the PHQ-9 your preferred depression screening tool, particularly for acute care, or is there another tool we should be using? So, so very nice, right? Very, very important question because you, you are trying to want to understand your patient objectively, right? Um, and you are guided by how the patient is, as you see. So for me, I use the, the uh, I sometimes use the PHQ-9, but I also use the HAMD as well. Now, it depends on what parameters are in the validated screening tools, right? And I always like to approach validated screening tools as, as, how simple it how the how simple it will be for me to detect depression um, without sacrificing the the nuances or missing out in terms of the specific parameters right now the thing that is very really important is that the depression skills are of course validated in, using the DSM five category right as a criteria for for the parameters or the variables right so it will depend on your practice as to how you are convenient as the one administering the the tool and versus how your patients will be able or your caregivers will be able to respond to the tool so um, i know long answer for a for a short question but um i use the hamdi um i don't use the phq9 um only because you know, like sometimes the pain, it it kind of varies, right? And you have to understand sometimes the patients will not be able to answer these questions right away. But again, it is depending on your comfort and your your experience to use the tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a question here from Alda. Thank you for your presentation. Can you comment on why you use the fatigue severity scale over the fatigue assessment scale? Yeah. Several of my sites use the fatigue assessment scale. So the fatigue assessment scale is also the one included in the, the uh, table for the evidence-based. Um, um, if you look at the checklist for the Canadian Stroke Best Practice, they use the fatigue assessment scale. I use the fatigue severity scale on follow-up of my patients only because it's fairly simple. Um, for me to kind of detect. And at least at that po point in time, I already have the information from my from my history to be able to, to gauge if this patient needs further assessment in terms of fatigue. So for me, as I said, I, I use this as per practice, as for my practice and how I kind of target if this patient needs intervention for an early fatigue uh, presentation or a late fatigue, or if I am anticipating. And this is where I incorporate the other skills if I do need more new ones to that. So again, answering in terms of the validated tools, it will depend on the comfort of the site and the comfort of the stroke team, right? For, for that one, yeah. Okay, there's a question from Shannon asking you to name the tool for depression again, because uh, she didn't quite get it. Um, so this one, I will write, I will type it. 
Um, okay. Yeah. Here, it's the HAMD depression rating scale. Okay, thank you. So now it's in the chat. H-A-M uh, dash D depression rating scale, just for those that are listening to the recording and won't have access to uh, to view the chat. Okay, and uh, from Candice, just to clarify, the administration of the PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9 is more appropriate to be done after the transition to inpatient rehab. What is a good timeline for administration for those waiting discharge home or long-term care who are in the hospital for several weeks pending this transition? Okay, so very important, right? Um, very varied in practice too, right? In terms of who are part of the team members to kind of check this, right? So number one, the guidelines tells us two to four weeks, we watch fully wait, right? Because we're getting to know the patient, right? Now, as I said earlier, the caveat is medically appropriate, right? Now, each patient is different in terms of the severity of the stroke and in terms of cognitive, behavioral, and emotional responses to the current disease state the patient is in. So two to four weeks allows us to be able to determine that, right? Minor, major strokes, right? Minor, moderate, major, major strokes, right? Now, in the two to four weeks time, if we sense we it is medically appropriate that we, this patient is able to give a sense of verbally or non-verbally, um, an expression of mood, depression, anxiety, or even fatigue, this is wherein we try to anticipate I can maybe screen this patient for uh, uh, using a PHQ-2 or your depression scales or your fatigue scales. So that is at least during the, the acute phase, right? Uh, this patient is inpatient, right? Now, two to four weeks, four weeks or so, six to 12 weeks, whether the patient is still inpatient to acute rehab, you do your snapshots of rating scales with the guiding with the guidance of your baseline um, scores, right? Is this patient improving? Is it stable? Has it decreased? Has it increased? Or is this patient scores increased enough that I will worry once this patient is discharged, I think I need to call the 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 primary care provider. Oops, I think we need we need to refer this patient right away to to the stroke prevention clinic to assess, right? Or our physiatrist to assess, right? So so two to four weeks watchful waiting, six to twelve weeks of kind of snapshots, right? And that will guide us in terms of whether the patient is in the rehab setting and on to the long term care how we're going to address. And this is where I do, if, if it's really helpful for me as a stroke clinician, if I do have some scores of, of any validated objective tool, right? Aside from my patient's information about themselves and family. So I think I'm guided by that, that, that timeline, at least that is, that is um, um, evidenced in, in the best practices. And now there's a, an additional question. When is the appropriate time to complete depression slash fatigue screening in acute setting? I've always hesitated or I always have hesitation to distinguish between depression and adjustment issues as these symptoms usually take time to develop. Yeah. So um, very nice. And very hard to answer. <laughs> very nice and very hard to answer, right? So, so something we we always kind of, and I think we're all stroke champions here. And um, I remember my 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 mentors in Calgary telling me, Erica, just trust your gut. Okay, so I'm going to apply that here to you, right? Because because you get to know the patient and and things evolve, right? And sometimes only time will tell you, right? And and our ability to predict. Is, is limited, right? But we are guided by how we have been trained and how we look after our own family and how we look after our patients, right? So what I, you have to understand, as I said, the stroke in itself is a life-changing event, right? And this is where you, will, it's normal. You will expect this, right? You will expect that sort of frustration or that sense of low mood, but, it is during that time you keep a watch, right? And, and by knowing the patient, you are able to anticipate 
is this patient is this mood going to be a problem when the patient begins to walk or if i do my 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 repetitive uh, motor movements will this patient be be will, will this be, patient be motivated enough right so hard to answer right so we are guided by our patients basically right and and the sense of when the patient will tell us um, whether verbally or non-verbally, whether we use objective tools, whether the family will, will tell us, we are guided but what how they will present to us. And it's something that is evolving over time. And we are humbled by that, right? Because um, in the end of the day, we, we may miss something, but in the end of the day, we can also have that sense of predict predicting it, right? So um, um, what I usually do, at least in my practice, um, I find out who the patient is, right? Family is there. I call the family, like um, try to get a sense of how this patient is in the community after before the stroke, right? And and sort of of how this patient is. I I see. I look at the notes of our physiotherapists, our speech and language um, pathologists in in the unit, our occupational therapists, right? How is this patient responding, right? And and when I do my rounds, the patient will tell me. I was able to walk today, right? I was able to do this. I was able to do this, or I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that, right? So I'm guided by how does how does this patient accept the limitations, and also how this patient sees the limitation, right? How he understands the limitation, and that in itself is a sense of will my patient be motivated, frustrated, frustrated enough not to be motivated? I I set I kind of like use that spectrum in my mind, so. Um, and 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 I think I think maybe you have your own spectrum in your mind too, right? And um, we are all we we all have cognitive biases and nuances in our daily life. And um, they they say don't bring your work at home, right? But more or less our own experiences as people, as persons, and taking care of our family, it integrates to how we also see our patients. So I think that is the best question the best answer to how i at least i am sharing to you um how i do it in in my practice okay thank you um we don't have any questions right now so i'll just uh oh eileen does so thank you dr Telleg, and i i appreciate how multivariant um the fatigue i'm going to come back to fatigue particular do you, do you, in your experience, is there any um, kind of recovery trajectory from fatigue that you um, can share with the group, knowing that it's so multivariable and knowing it can um, initiate at any time in the recovery journey? Um, is there anything that you can share with as far as uh, a recovery trajectory? All right. So lots of um, many ways to answer this question. Number one, based on the type of stroke and the severity of the stroke, right? It makes sense the ma more major the stroke is or more significant the deficits er are, you will expect fatigue, depression, and at least all the physical variabil variables that I presented in the model, it will take a little bit more time, right? Depending on the major stroke. So major strokes with higher NIHSS, depending on whether they received hyperacute treatment or not, it may not get better, it may remain stable, or it may get better, right? Now, patients who did receive the hyperacute treatment and we kind of saw a decrease in NIHSS, the evidence tells us, at least from my readings, 12 months to about three to five years, this patient's outcome is a lot better than those who did not receive the hyperacute treatment who had major debilitating strokes. And because they are debilitating, this patient remain on plateau or they actually decline. Now, we do have a set of patients who are in between the moderate and the minor strokes. They fluctuate in between, right? And this is where we get re-referrals. This patient had a stroke, no problems, and then had, had this issue with, with, with cognition. So we're seeing it in the dimension of lingering chronic um, um, effect of stroke on cognition. And this is where fatigue, mood, and depression comes to play, right? So that is another timeline or trajectory, right? 
everything is okay, everything plateau, everything stable, slightly improvement, not declining. But then after maybe two to three years, we see cognitive impairment. So this is where I know there's a session for neurocognitive impairment here that mm -hmm. comes into play, right? Am I understanding that the post-stroke recovery is already, and stroke plays a variable in, in that aspect, right? And this mm -hmm. is where you kind of see the fatigue and the mood is, is playing with cognition rather than the stroke recovery. So again, about major strokes, the larger the vessel infarction and the greater the, debility of the disability, longer, longer, more than 12 months or so, moderate to minor strokes, relatively shorter, less than maybe three years or so. Now, of course, you have the variable of putting in your pharmacological interventions, right? And we can halt that trajectory in terms of, 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 of um, shortening that kind of interval. So I think that's the kind of like, at least the ballpark from the, the many studies that there are out there. But as I said, it's so hard to measure it, right? Mm -hmm. Fatigue assessment scale or fatigue severity scale and then the apathy scales, depending on what the site uses, right? And, and the clinicians, clinicians use. So that's just a kind of like how to predict this. The problem, number two, when to expect, right? Now we also have unusual cases, right? Major yeah. strokes, but they're relatively okay, right? Like in terms of like, even though there's significant disability and there are things that they cannot do, they're relatively okay. And they've been able to manage the fatigue, right? And, and family is there. And, and they're, they're, they, they come to me and say, Dr. Teleg, I'm still grateful. Because I can stand, right? So mm -hmm. this is mindset, right? And this is where you kind of guide your patient to that mindset, um, despite the the disability the patient may have. Yeah. And may I continue the the question? So knowing that, knowing that kind of recovery trajectory, and thinking about on the inpatient to, uh, side of things, especially on the inpatient rehab continuum, we have such a focus now on rehab intensity and trying to do the most we can to take yeah. take that opportunity while they're on an inpatient. How does fatigue enable or disadvantage that rehab intensity perspective? Okay, so very hard question because I'm not a physiatrist, right? But this is how I, I will kind of like approach it, right? So it's something consistent that you will see right? As you build on the patient's endurance, right? Now, in terms of how fatigue, in terms of the rehabilitation intensity, I would just have this patient do that program, right? And see how this patient, because you, you, you will do it in graded manner, right? In terms of the, the rehab intensity, right? And you're also on the back of your mind, I don't want to exhaust this patient, right? You're also like, I don't want to exhaust this patient and doesn't want to see me. You'll pretend I'm sleeping, right? <laughs> you, you don't want that kind of nuance, right? So um, I'm going to channel that to Dr. Natalia here in Freeport, right? In terms of, of my physiatrist colleagues for, for that kind of, um, of like a more precise answer to that because um, you, you, you know the patient, how he does the first session and then the second session. And then by the third session, you already have an idea, right? Like if I can go more or I gotcha make it slower, right? Because you, in the end of the day, you want an outcome that the patient is optimum in, in doing. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the kind of challenge, right, for it. So, like, yeah, it depends. It depends on you and, and the patient, right? Our, we, we have our own approach <laughs> to actually, like, go, you can do it. Like, be a cheerleader for the patient. Or, like, okay, let's let's take this day and then do this just this right like it we, we're so different everyone is so different right just as our patients are and we try to adapt to that knowing in the back of the mind we we want the best for our patients right so no no real answer i guess <laughs> well and being patient centered that's what we're all after but we yeah. also know the realities of the evidence and um, i'm going to call it the system logistics of patient flow so just trying to put it all together so we really are delivering best patient centered care with the best outcomes that's right <laughs> okay Thank you. Uh, just have a couple more minutes left if anyone does have a question. Um, and so feel free to raise your hand and ask it verbally or write it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, just letting everyone know that if there aren't any questions, we could wrap up. 
Um, tomorrow, everyone that registered will receive an email and it will have the recording of the webinar and a link to the presentation slides. Uh, and if a question comes to you uh, later, feel free to email uh, me. I, my email will be in the follow-up from Zoom um, or and I'll reach out to Anna and to Dr. Teleg with your questions. Um, so thank you again very much, Dr. Teleg, for your enthusiasm, your, your passion uh, in this topic that is so complex and you gave us uh, best practices, you gave us, you know, checklists, and you also gave us your personal experience. So a really fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.